So, all right. Um, again, very quick, quick plug this time. Thanks uh, for, but you have been, all of you guys have been there yesterday, so you know how much I love Elgato. And um, um, I love it as much that I'm sharing a room with uh, Uli. So if, it, if that's not showing my love to Elgato, I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, now let's move to my dear friend, Otvin Gens, which is uh, always trying to remember me, oh, I suck, and I thank him for that. Um, <laughs> because as, as much as it sounds very weird and muzzle chest, um, he's always trying to remind me that good enough is not good enough. Um, I'm, I'm going to sp skip on, on, on showing the video of his talk from last year, uh, but um, if you haven't seen that, go back and see it again. Um, I guess what he's going to show us today is, is uh, uh, again, a lot of those amazing UI tricks, but uh, even better. And so uh, uh, let's um, introduce him in, in my way, uh, which I think a lot of you will like, that I every time say a few nice words about all those guys. Uh, the way I see um, Altwin is that uh, he's uh, swizzling everything he can. Um, and I hope only in code. Um, but, um, and also, um, that he showed me a few tricks, which some of them are not working anymore in iOS 6, uh, which, are, uh, which are amazing. And um, if you look at his app, where too, and the, the new one called uh, Streets, um, I almost said the old name. Um, it's um, it's actually pretty pretty awesome. Um, he's also part of my secret weapon list that I showed you yesterday with Alex and and many others. And um, again, like I said, he's always uh, always ready to to spank me, but in a good way uh, to remind me the things that are working well or working not well. Also for this conference, I got a lot of, of uh, very good tips from him. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Altwin Gans. Well. Thanks for the kind introduction stuff. Um, I'm, uh, I, I hopefully don't disappoint you this, uh, this time because I, in this talk, in this version of the talk, there's no method swizzling at all anymore. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, short, uh, I short uh, introduction about me, about my products basically. Um, these are the two apps. Um, I'm. Uh, Having on the on the App Store, it's where to. It's a points of interest finder, and uh, the new app Streets we we launched this year, um, which is a Street View uh, client, basically. Um, what I want to focus first um, in this talk is about basically how to deal with artwork. Um, of course. Um, uh, you have artwork in, in many kinds, and, and the, of course there are different approaches how to how to deal with artwork, um, whether you do it like in Photoshop or in, in code or so. And of course there are like different philosophies on that. Um, my stance really is um, I, I really prefer to have like a, a separation there between like the, the, the developer and the designer. So um, the designers, of course, obviously work with Photoshop. That's their tool. That's their uh, creativity, whatever uh, tool they, they work with. And so I really do everything I can with, with, uh, with artwork, with pings, basically, and do nothing in code. Um, I think that's, that's really the way to go, because sometimes uh, designers want like a little bit of a shadow here and there. and. Um, that just beats you when you, when you do everything in code. Um, so, of course, the, the first question is uh, how to do this Photoshop to UI kit conversion, basically. How to, how to bring uh, a big PSD with all the layers and stuff like that uh, into UI kit in a, in a good way. Um, and, and, I mean, slicing that in whatever pings is easy in, ma in many cases. Sometimes you have a problem with the, with the image sizes. If you have a very rich uh, UI with a lot of uh, images and so on, um, you have to think about what, what's the best way to, to put everything uh, in, in images. And um, uh, the canonical way that everybody normally uses, I guess, is, is just using pings for everything. But um, I think sometimes one should uh, think twice and think about JPEGs at least for like background stuff or so where it's not really about um, monochromatic things or so but, but like structured textures or so. Um, we 
for example, in where to this leather background, uh, we um, made a huge uh, space saving just by, by using JPEG instead of Ping for that. Um, JPEG, of course, is, uh, has a major drawback. It has no tr transparency. So uh, as, so as soon as you have anything transparent, JPEG is not really the way to go, except there is actually something in between, uh, which is called uh, JPNG. It's basically a mixture between JPEG and, and ping. Um, so it's basically a JPEG with a, an alpha channel of a ping that allows you to um, still define a transparency um, um, even though it's a JPEG. And I think that's interesting. There's a category on, on UI image here, uh, so it makes it quite easy to, to work with these. And um, I haven't done it uh, personally, but um, I think that's really an interesting um, yeah, interesting way, interesting technology to use. And also one technology I think overseen by many is uh, that, uh, that you can really use PDF for, 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 for icons, for anything I, I guess that uh, um, is more or less like iconic or so, or has more or less just an outline or so. I think for that really PDF is a, is a great choice because it's uh, resolution independent, so you don't need 1x, 2x artwork. Um, so in a lot of cases, I, I guess uh, PDF is a, is a good choice to use. Especially now that now with iOS 7, where we have more like just very um, reduced artwork with not a lot of shadows and anything. Uh, I guess for that, PDF is really an interesting uh, alternative. Um, when saving from uh, from Photoshop, uh, you have to be aware that Photoshop, even the uh, the setting with the smallest file size, is not really that optimized for 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 for, for size basically. Um, so sometimes it's it's a good idea to to use uh, an app like Shrink It uh, from the Panic guys to um, to compress it down um, with the built-in. Uh, Mac OS 10 PDF engine. You could use uh, Preview for that as well, but Trinket makes it a little bit easier. You can just drag and drop it, and it, it uh, automatically replaces the PDFs with the shrinked version. So for the workflow, I guess it's a good thing. Um, on the other hand, we always kind of have that uh, question of trade-offs, right? Um, um, like for example, one trade-off is uh, could we uh, re reuse uh, pictures in, in like for different sizes or so? And there, of course, um, it totally makes sense to have these nine-patch images, like resizable images, basically where we ha just have the uh, the the corner images, basically, and we can just resize them easily. One thing that uh, that bites you there is, uh, at least, at least in, in in my case, designers love to have uh, noise or pattern on, on on buttons to give them a little bit more textured feel or so. Um, that of course bites you. So you probably, if you want to make use of resizing for buttons and any anything or borders, um, you should uh, remove the noise and pattern. Otherwise, uh, those you get those very ugly stretch effects. Then, of course, when you're splitting layers uh, from a Photoshop into, into multi multiple PNGs, um, it's always a good question what to do with the layer effects, So, um, which is, of course, not an easy question. Sometimes uh, your best choice is just to, uh, to remove them. Sometimes um, there are like substitutes with CA layer that you can make use of. So, um, but that's uh, always like, this step is always kind of a manual one. Uh, there's no easy solution to just say, okay, I take this Photoshop layer effect and what's the equivalent in, in, in UI kit or core animation or CA layer, to, for example. It's sometimes a little bit of a trade-off either um, by skipping some of the layer effects that are a little bit just obscure or not, not that prominent or so, or trying to replicate them uh, with CA layer. 
Um, there's a bunch of tools I, I make use of, and I want to, to highlight a few of them. Um, one is uh, a cool tool um, called Wasted. That's um, even if you have pings, um, there's a lot of in a lot of cases um, you can drastically reduce pings by um, by shrinking them. Um, there is a bunch of different technologies being used there in, 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 in a tool like Wasted. There are other ones. Wasted, is, I think, is, is a very easy to use one. You can just drop an IPA on it or an Xcode archive and it automatically goes through all the images. Um, it tries to, like for, for uh, completely opaque PNGs, it uh, tries whether it makes sense to to convert them to J JPEGs with 90% uh, um, uh, quality or accuracy, uh, no optimization level, whatever. And if it's if it's smaller, it uh, it replaces them by the JPEG. Um, and for pure PNGs, there's also a lot of uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, it can try to, um, to, to, to shrink them by requantifying. So in a lot of cases, like Photoshop, for example, saves PNGs as 24-bit, uh, and sometimes it, it's easier to just uh, um, uh, have them in 8-bit, for example. So there are a lot of techniques, and this is a typical example, um, which I think speaks for itself, six megabytes uh, saved might make the difference uh, whether your app is uh, uh, can be downloaded via uh, 3G or not. I think 30 megabytes is right now the, the limit, if I'm not mistaken. So, 50. is it right? I think it's 50. 50 now? Okay. So, but still, I mean, sometime you, you hit the wall and, and that definitely makes sense to, to if you can, to, to, to stay under that limit because otherwise, uh, Customers cannot download, download it via cellular network. So, uh, wasted is one. Uh, pixel slice is another one I like um, that makes it easy to create these uh, resizable images, like for buttons or so, that you can resize easily. Um, it's just a few bucks on the App Store. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't found any tool that is really retina aware with the add to X images. This one is nice, but it doesn't really um, make a difference whether the, the picture is an add to X image um, or not. Um, it should, of course, uh, in this case, if you throw an add to X image on it, it should only um, uh, basically uh, shrink it or uh, to, to um, odd, not to, to even numbers, basically, so you can. Um, um, yeah, do the resizing on, on even numbers. Uh, there's another one called um, Slicey that I like. Um, that this uh, uh, um, solves the problem that in, in a PSD, when you have whatever uh, 50 different uh, uh, PNGs that come out of a single PSD, for example, and you change just a little bit whatever uh, uh, um, a common color or anything that affects all of these uh, pings, basically, it would be a nightmare to export all of them uh, manually. And, and the slicing uh, feature of Photoshop in, in, in many cases just doesn't, doesn't cut it because it's more or less just basically slicing what's on screen but cannot really differentiate like a, a selec selected or highlighted state if, if it's basically on the same um, uh, on, in the same region in different layers. For that, Slicey is really a great tool. Um, it allows you basically to, to say, okay, this specific uh, layer or, or group of layers basically uh, will end up in, in a different PNG. And you can specify basically the rectangle which is uh, used for the for the uh, for the size of the ping. So um, Slicey is really a great uh, tool to to export layers. It al also automatically um, uh, checks basically whether the PSD is changed. So you can just hit save in the PSD, and anything uh, um, it will automatically detect that and and uh, export all the PNGs again. So. For that, it's really a, a, a huge time saver. Um, stealing from the OS. Um, 
in a lot of cases uh, there's artwork which is already there in, in the OS in whatever in, in different apps in different uh, uh, frameworks of the OS and uh, why not just use them it makes up for a consistent UI experience between your app and, and Apple's app and for that um, I really recommend this great tool from uh, Cedric is it right so um, it's called iOS Artwork Extractor, and it, what, what it basically does, it lists all, it goes through, on the, it, it runs on the simulator, and, it, and you can go through all the uh, frameworks, um, being it UIKit or GameKit or all the frameworks basically, and, and, and extracts all the, the images from there, and you can just um, browse through them, and if you need one of them or so, you can just hit save and, and uh, use that image for, for your purposes. Um, one thing to keep in mind here, uh, if it runs in retina mode, then you always get the add to, add to X version. So if you need both, you have to run it once in retina and once in normal mode uh, to get both uh, versions of the image. Um, Switching over to UI appearance, so this, the first step was about all the images to get the images into, into, into your app. Uh, the next thing, of course, is to style the app in a, in a consistent way and, the, of course, UI appearance is a good way to do that. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy for, uh, for your designer to do like um, UI appearance code he sh to, to basically to have a good interface with your designer because of course the designers don't like to to touch your code or so and I think it's a good thing that they shouldn't touch your code. Um, one, one solution to address this is uh, a technolo technology called UIKit style sheets where basically um, you can replace a code like this, standard appearance code, by basically a definition like this which is um, more something like designers are used to. Uh, if, if, this, if it's a designer that has done some HTML, CSS work, this is quite familiar for them. And um, it even allows you basically to, to experiment with different uh, style sheets and it's even possible to, to change that on the fly. So for designers, I guess, or for the collaboration with uh, developers and designers, it's, I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, so it has an easy to read JSON uh, syntax. Um, it uh, allows live updates via HTTP. So you can, uh, yeah, uh, experiment easily. It basically, at the end, it generates UI appearance code. So it, it basically, the power of it, it's the same like UI appearance, basically. And this is the link where you can get it. So. Um, I haven't used it extensively um, myself, but um, this, at least it sounds really, really interesting to me too. If, if, if there's a lot of like um, back and forth with your designer um, for, for stuff like that. Um, next topic is layout. So, um, of course, you all know code like this where you um, have to fiddle around with the frame, with whatever, to, to position your, your views in your, sub, in your view hierarchy. Um, and, and that's, of course, always uh, very, a, lot of, a lot of code for basically not a lot of functionality. And there are different approaches to that. Um, one approach I, I kind of like is um, uh, uh, from the guys at... Uh, Citrix, if I'm, um, if I'm, if I'm right, I guess it was from the guys at Citrix. Um, they released an open source uh, library that basically allows you to um, specify those layout um, rules more in a in a in easy to to read, easy to understand uh, manner. And I, th I guess. When you, when you look at both versions, uh, the, the, the lower one is way easier to grasp basically what it actually does. I find myself a lot of times in this, when I have this old code that I have to, to understand what I'm, am I doing here and it's not easily understandable. You actually have to read the code or you have to comment, of course, what, 
what is actually done there. And I think the, the lower one is just very easy to grasp, basically. Of course, the, um, uh, in, in iOS 6, Apple uh, added auto layout, and that promised at least to um, solve all these issues. Um, in many ways, um, it does, of course, solve these issues. But uh, on the other hand, at least in iOS 6, in the old SDK, uh, the interface builder was by far not optimal, I would say. So um, I, in, in the Streets app, we completely relied on auto layout and, and fought with uh, the tools there. And it's, um, while it's, it's great in some ways, if you change something or so, that. Um, that you have by far less code, of course, um, you end up sometimes um, like just fighting against the tools, and, and that's of course, yeah, sometimes frustrating at least. Um, particularly, um, I was at when I when I started with auto layout, I found myself asking, how can I basically? How can I animate anything like uh, whatever view flying in from there or stretching or whatever in an animated way? Because, of course, you used to do it like in a UI view animation and do whatever your set center, set frame in the animation block. And that's, of course, not, not uh, possible anymore with auto layout. So, how to do that with auto layout? Well, um, the code to do that looks a little at least a little bit uh, strange at first. What you basically do is um, you have a constraint for anything you want to animate. Uh, you set the new constant for that constraint, and then in the animation block, you just call layout if needed uh, for that view. Uh, to me, that was at least not obvious, and perhaps it's helpful for anyone who's uh, in the same situation. By the way, um, for all of you, short uh, question, who's actually using auto layout? Hands up. Who, ha who hates it? Who will never use it? <laughs> OK, so the majority actually yeah, is, is fine with auto layout. And I think it's, of course, the, 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 the direction Apple is going. So we kind of have to get used to it and have to work with it. And of course, Apple is working on it. and, and the tools get better, so um, yeah, I think it's it's just fine to to go with it in for the future. Um, next topic: view debugging. Um, in a lot of cases, um, things are kind of look strange, and you have to have to fiddle with the view hierarchy and see what's going on, actually. And there are a bunch of tech tools and, and, and ways to, to work with the view hierarchy. And I want to highlight some. Um, the, most, uh, the easiest one, of course, is just using rec recursive description. It's, um, it's built into the OS, so just uh, call recursive description on any view and you see um, uh, the subview hierarchy. Um, I always find it um, a little bit, the output of that is, I think, in, 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 a, in many ways, not really intuitive, because all of the, the frame um, settings or frame um, numbers, um, frame sizes, and positions are, of course, relative, depending on their uh, re respective superview. So what I, I um, basically did was uh, a little bit of an improvement to, um, to output all the, the coordinates in, in basically the window um, coordinate system to better understand, OK, that's a button uh, in, in whatever at the, at the top of my window or in the toolbar at the bottom or so. It's just way easier if you have basically the coordinate always um, converted to absolute coordinates. That's available on, on my GitHub. Um, just yeah, just download it and, and um, make use of it. Um, what I find, uh, what I found um, practical um, um, to work with these things, basically, a recursive description is always kind of a long way to type. Um, put that in, into your uh, home LLDB in it. And then you are able to just type RD, or in my case, this improved version is RE for, ex for explode. 
so re recursive descri description or recursive explode um, uh, that allows you to to dump the whole view hier hierarchy of the window or if you're just interested in a in just a specific uh, view um, just um, type rd and, and and the view you you're interested in um, there are of course uh, a lot more tools um, available um, that need to have something basically um, added to your to your app to to work with that one I like is DC introspect um, it's basically it allows you to to hit the space key or the the, uh, the sh shuffle the device or uh, initiate the shuffling um, from from the from the simulator menu, and then it allows you basically to interactively debug uh, your view. So uh, basically, you can see all the views with frames on it, and um, you can fine tune whatever some pixels down, some pixels left, or so for a specific label or anything, just in a live manner. So you don't have to recompile and and wait for it or so. So you can just um, yeah, fiddle around with exact positioning, for example. I, f I find it very useful for like cell uh, layouts or so. We have to yeah carefully adjust the positions of the labels and stuff like that. Um, it's also on GitHub. It's open source. Yeah, this is uh, the help screen. Basically, that all works with keyboard navigation. So you have like the the, the decimal keys or so to to uh, move your view up and down and, and change the sizes. You can change the alpha and stuff like that and hide views and show them again, stuff like that. So you can basically just yeah, select the views and, and in this case just move them and move them back, uh, all with keyboard navigation. It's kind of, kind of neat. I extended this a little bit um, to even um, uh, basically adjust uh, my own uh, parameters in a, in, with that keyboard navigation. In this case, this is um, uh, my augmented reality mode in where to, and I needed a way to do screenshots, of course, without being at that, at that actual position in whatever San Francisco or any, any other location. Uh, of course, we do, uh, localized screenshots for 13 different languages and you cannot be in all these countries so what I basically do for these screenshots is take a uh, take an image of, of a road there sometimes just using street view images put that into the simulator as the background basically and then um, uh, adjust basically the or, or simulate the location and and then of course you have to to move around in the right way and to adjust the horizon sometimes. So for all that, uh, I found it easy to just uh, basically modify this uh, core motion value or mo core motion position in, in the world by, by just using the same keyboard navigation style. Um, and the nice thing is this is even uh, scriptable. So I can script that and, and say, okay, uh, 10 times a four to mo move whatever 10 degrees right or so. And I can script that and, and, and create all the screenshots with just a, uh, action basically. And I mean, it's a lot of work to, to set this up uh, initially, but if it works, it's, it's, really, it's really nice. <clears throat> Another new tool that uh, recently came up, it's, it's not yet final, it's in open beta, uh, anyone can uh, download it for free, is Reveal. Um, it's, it's basically um, what, what they are doing is um, uh, to put your whole view hierarchy in a, in a 3D model. So you can um, just tilt it in any way and, and see basically the, the, how, how the views are basically stacking. Uh, in a 3D way, you can uh, expand uh, any view and see the exact subview hierarchy in this case. Uh, it's really, yeah, giving some perspective and, and it's, it's, yeah, a graphical way to work with uh, your views. Um, you can, can, of course, also change 
uh, anything. You can change all the view properties and, and adjust whatever uh, sizes and positions and anything. So yeah, it looks uh, like a very interesting, powerful tool to me. A tool to me. I don't know what the actual um, uh, uh, retail price for that will be when it's out of beta, but um, that, cool, uh, that tool really looks, looks quite interesting. Um, to, do, to build that or to use that in your app, the, 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 the only thing what you do is basically insert a framework of them into your, um, into your uh, project basically and that's it and then you can connect it um, with this app both to the simulator and to the actually running device uh, and they yeah, talk via bonjour so you can just see them when, when the device is in the same Wi-Fi. Um, there's an open source tool as well called Pony Debugger, uh, which also has um, some uh, view deb debugging mechanisms. Um, they basically um, s uh, make use of uh, the Chrome developer mode of, of Google Chrome browser, and they allow also to basically go through the view hierarchy and highlight. Uh, any view and you can also even change um, um, you can even change parameters like sizes and positions. I find it a little bit more limited. Um, it wasn't my favorite tool. It, I, I also exp uh, had some some strange incompatibilities with AF networking, which I'm using for for networking. Don't know what it was exactly, but. Um, uh, I find also like it's quite limited. It just allows you to, to reposition the views and not, nothing more like um, uh, advanced properties or so. Maybe I'm, I'm, I, I was just uh, not, uh, I didn't look uh, enough. Maybe there is some, some more stuff I just I didn't discover, but um, yeah. It, on the other hand, it also has some, some completely different features like for network monitoring, for core data stuff. So um, you definitely might want to have a look at it because it might, might be interesting for other debugging purposes. It, this, it's the same like reveal that it also allows you uh, to connect uh, via the network. So you can in this case even do uh, completely remote uh, debugging basically um, when you initialize uh, uh, the connection to, to the server you can just specify any IP uh, or, or host name or so to connect to. So it's basically a server running on your machine and uh, the simulator or the device connects to it and, and they yeah, exchange uh, with each other. Um, so much for UI debugging. Um, completely different topic, um, UI buttons. Um, I, in, a, in a lot of cases, I was kind of missing a very, uh, to me, obvious uh, thing, basically. I wanted to, to uh, enlarge uh, the touchable area of a button. Uh, like when you, when you work with navigation bars, everyone is used to it, like that the back button extends the touchable area way be, beyond the, the navigation bar. And in uh, many cases, that's just desirable for, for any button. And that's really kind of the, those, those little touches or so that makes it easier to use the app. Sometimes an app just doesn't feel good because it's always too fiddly to, to, to really to hit the, the button targets. And that's sometimes just a matter of uh, the size of the touch target. And um, for some reason, there's no API uh, to specify that. So, um, but it's, on the other hand, it's quite easy to, to solve that um, by just overwriting the hit test method. Um, one, one, have one thing to keep in mind, the super view must of course be large enough. So if you extend the hit test region um, of the button, then of course, uh, and, the, and the view is, is just the same size of the button, then it doesn't help, of course. So this is to keep in mind. Um, so you cannot easily, for example, extend the touch target of a button in a navigation bar that it extends uh, over the navigation bar. That's kind of a limit there, but I think in most cases uh, uh, you can easily work around that. I also have some demo code uh, there that you can uh, just have a look at if you, if you need to, to extend the button touch targets.
Another interesting um, thing about buttons, uh, which is uh, overlooked, I think, in by many, is, is the selected state of buttons. Um, I saw so much demo code, or so much code, basically for like open source stuff and anything, um, where people mess around. Um, with, uh, with images basically and say, okay, we changed the state of the button and we, we now change the image of, of the button. Um, in many cases, it's just easier to specify or to use the selected state for that. And um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's way better than, than the set image state. Um, you, the, the only thing is the selected state isn't activated automatically. So you always have to say, uh, I want this button to be selected, right? Um, so for example, if you have uh, an on-off button or so, stuff like that, then you can just say, okay, on is, is uh, the selected state and you set it to selected and, and switch back and forth. You can even specify the selected image in IB, so it's, it's uh, fine to do that. Uh, the only thing missing, I don't know why, is, is the combination of highlighted and selected state. It's, it's, a, it's a basically bit field where you have to or uh, highlighted and selected together. And of course that's needed if you tap on a selected uh, button to have the highlighted state there as well. Yeah, this one unfortunately is missing in IB, so you have to, in, in your view that load, you have to um, adjust for that and set the this combination of highlighted and selected uh, manually in code. Coming to uh, UI WebView, um, I used UI WebView a lot um, in, in many situations where it's not really obvious uh, that a WebView uh, would cut the deal, um, especially more so in, uh, in projects where we had to, uh, where we had still iOS 5. Uh, compatibility because there was no NS attributed string or NS attributed string uh, drawing capabilities. Um, there, of course, for, for rich text stuff, uh, web views are the canonical choice. So um, there's only if you use web views for, for those little like. Uh, um, attributed labels and buttons and stuff like that. In many cases, you need them transparent to work with like different backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, it's not easily possible just by doing a background color clear color as one would assume. You also have to set the opaque to no and of course also have to have a, a transparent background color in your HTML which is maybe not obvious. So on the other hand, if you're working with HTML from a foreign server that you have no control over, um, the way to, to achieve it uh, would be basically to load the HTML and then do some JavaScript magic to, to set the body color to transparent, if that might make sense. Of course, that could break in many ways, but in most, most cases, uh, when used like that, you have control over the HTML and can just um, um, can just use it. Also, when working with web views in like in like table view cells, for example, it's often uh, nice to to support the highlighted state in web views, and and that's surprisingly easy actually to do. Normally, of course, why would I have? Uh, how could I do highlighted in a web view? Well, you can just use JavaScript for that as well. Um, just uh, implement set highlighted and and yeah do some whatever uh, you, you search your your um, main body and and uh, main body element and and set the style uh, color to whatever color you you need for highlighted. Um, the nice thing is if you really name it like uh, this. Um, uh, it, it works out of the box for cell highlighting, like table view if you have a sub view with a web view and have this basically implemented in your web view subclass, um, it automatically works when the cell is, is highlighted. Um, another thing um, always to debug, to debug this, um, I highly recommend the web inspector um, for 
um, uh, for anything you need to debug with JavaScript and stuff like that. Um, just uh, launch Safari, connect to your simulator um, or even the device, I guess it's possible. Um, so you can just yeah, fiddle around with the JavaScript and, and search whatever um, element you need to change and, um, and do, your, do your stuff in the web inspector. Um, speaking also of uh, web view, uh, this is kind of a legacy problem. It's, it goes away with iOS 7, but we ha always in web views, at least if they are scrollable, um, you had these uh, ugly grayish uh, shadows on top and at the bottom. And um, sometimes you just want to get, uh, get rid of them. This is the way to go. Um, so always like this is always code of co of course that is um, part of uh, um, your, your web view subclass. You can just um, yeah go through all the the sub views of the of the web view and if it's an image view just hide it and and that uh, gets rid of of these. Um, intercepting touches, I, of course web view always grabs. Uh, the focus basically, and if you if you if you touch basically, then web view does its magic and and works with the internal web document view to um, to do all the touch handling basically. So if you have uh, the need to implement like a button or so where you want to control what happens uh, when the user touches it, um, the way to go is basically overwrite hit test. And it's a little bit tricky because um, the UI web view actually doesn't do the touch handling by itself. It delegates this to the internal UI web document view. And what you have to do basically is to, to grab this uh, basically by, by using the super, super implementation, save that in an IVAR or property or so, and, and return self to make sure that you are actually um, uh, uh, called when, when the user touches it. And then you can uh, just implement or override all the touch events you want, like touches began or so, um, to, to work uh, to actually um, intercept these touches and do something like highlight or whatever you want to do. Or just, yeah, uh, I mean, that's of course, um, depending on your imagination, what you want to do then. Um, last topic. Um, Table view performance, it's, it's always uh, yeah, uh, an, an important aspect or, or sometimes hard to do aspects. Um, there are different um, aspects to the problem what, uh, with regards to table view performance. One and one uh, big topic is always hate calculation. Um, which is of course only interesting if you if you have variable row heights, um, and then the the other question of course being uh, the cell drawing itself, how to do that in a performant way. Um, here, I think it's really helpful to test on old hardware. So test on the slowest hardware you, you support to make sure you still get a um, good enough frame rate, which should be in the like 50 to second, uh, 60 uh, frames per second um, uh, rate um, to make sure you really have a very smooth uh, table view scrolling, uh, scrolling performance. Um, The important thing about, to know about the, this hate calculation thing is um, this actually affects the loading or uh, the loading performance of your table view. So if you like in a, in a typical situation where you push a table view controller onto the navigation stack and you have a table view with uh, variable row heights, um, what happens basically is uh, that the table view um, queries your data source about all the, the heights of all the different uh, cells, basically. And that could take a long time, depending on how many cells you have. So make sure that this height calculation code is really um, as fast as possible, because it, it's, it's basically it's, it's done right now when you, when you uh, uh, start or when you, when you uh, um, init a table view. 
So, uh, do you recommend uh, doing auto layout in table your cells? Good question. Um, I haven't really, I haven't really tried it that much. I cannot really, I cannot really judge, to be honest. I did, and it was. It really was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. And it's really hard to do because. Um, yeah, there are some super calls not called in UI table view cell, and um, yeah, so you basically need to do some prototype cells for the height calculation only, and it's uh, you need to invalidate those calculation cells mm. each time you iterate over your um, uh, over your table. Um, so um, I would do manual height calculation here. So did you identify height calculation as a problem or the actual cell drawing? Because I think those are really uh, completely different topics. Actually, the height calculation is if you want to render text in a multi-line uh, way um, almost as expensive as the drawing. So height calculation was um, yeah, expensive. Yeah. I think, I mean, what Apple does with iOS 7 really uh, will, be, will be great. I haven't really tested it a lot with this estimate, estimated row height stuff yeah, they, a, they introduced. That's but a it really sounds cool at idea. least very promising to say, okay, uh, let's, let's just uh, guess it's, it's that height. And if we actually go through it, then we know better, which is, I think, the right way to do it, to do it lazily, as we heard yesterday. Um, so yeah, that, I'm, I'm really, really glad they, they introduced this. So really good new API. Yeah. Um, so some approaches for height calculation. There are different approaches, of course, to do that in a quick manner. Um, size with font is probably the, the most commonly used uh, um, uh, method to, to calculate the height of whatever text field or so you have. Um, there are different friends, of course. Uh, um, one, another one is uh, basically if, you're, if you have just a large text field, which is a UI text view, then you can just rely on the size that fits uh, of the text view. Um, another one is, of course, you could always do full pre-rendering and sometimes <laughs> it's not even that much slower as, as one, might, uh, what one might think, I guess. Um, or what, what I also sometimes use is um, basically an approach uh, that uh, is kind of similar to the approach Apple chose with iOS 7 now to, to say, okay, we just use whatever arbitrary Try value we think might uh, might work, and and then adjust later when we know better. Like for ex for example, if you have a web view in a cell, and the web view height is uh, is depending on the content, then of course you just don't know at the uh, the time of height calculation what it will actually be. So what you can do, of course, is always assume a, a constant height or like with some heuristics uh, that, that it might make sense or, uh, or so. And then if it's actually, as soon as it's actually rendered, uh, then, you can, um, then you can basically, then you get the, the size of the web view uh, in the web view delegate call. And then you can return that uh, to the table view to adjust the, the actual sale height. Not, not optimal, I know, but uh, sometimes um, I guess it's um, yeah, just the best way you can do it. Um, for cell drawing, uh, cell drawing actually, um, there are also some, some tips that uh, um, um, make it uh, make sense to, um, to have um, performance cell drawing. Um, one thing I, um, I discovered really is transparency actually hurts you. Um, so as soon as you have um, a transparent cells, that really badly affects uh, the, the scrolling performance. Uh, so avoid transparencies as if you can. On the other hand, um, as soon as you have like an animated selection, uh, select animated or deselect animated, be careful because that might look ugly in this case, that when a label has an uh, opaque background and you do an animated uh, select or deselect, uh, that might uh, look ugly in this case. Uh, you could even go that far that just um, prior and after the selection, you, you change the transparency of labels or so, but that's of course a lot of work and 
questionable whether it really is a good idea. Um, if you have uh, core animation shadows, if you use core animation shadows like for, let's say, images uh, to, to give the image uh, a little bit of a shadow, for example, really make sure to use the shadow path for, for animation, uh, for, 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 the, um, uh, for the layer. So let's say you have um, an icon you, you're showing, make sure um, that you actually specify the path of that icon. Um, because that really drastically in, improves the performance of um, core animation shadows. Without that, it's really barely usable to, to actually uh, use core animation shadows. I found that, yeah, it's, it's, the frame rate goes to whatever, zero. <laughs> My personal opinion is avoid draw rect as much as possible. There are different attitudes towards that. Um, I always found it uh, not to work very well to really draw uh, cells um, directly with draw rect. If you have something that you have to compose uh, with drawing methods, uh, what I found uh, working way better is to basically draw in the background to a UI image and, and uh, just show this uh, UI image in a plain UI image view. That's, I think, working way better than to draw directly into the cell. Then you can cache it, so sometimes if you have uh, like the same, Im the same parameters or so, you can uh, just pull it from a cache and otherwise you at least have it, uh, you can at least draw that in the, on a background thread. That's possible to draw in a background thread in a UI image. So you can do that lazily or, 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 or even yeah, uh, right away, but, but on a background thread. So it doesn't really hurt the, the actual uh, main thread UI kit performance. Any, any questions? With UI web view, um, trying to get an accurate uh, height for something, if you have a fairly complex page, I've, I've, you know, uh, I've experimented with different things, ultimately always having to use JavaScript to get the, the inner height of, of a particular DOM element. But uh, sometimes when you're loading a page where the, 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 the longest running operation is to, to get the image to that's going to ultimately be an IMG element. It's nice to be able to to, to be able to ask the the web view for the the total height and and get that so that especially if you have other views within within the parent view, you can lay things out. Have you, sometimes the the web view did finish loading gets called multiple multiple times and you get different answers if you use the JavaScript you know introspection thing. Have you any idea why or? Yeah, so, so I think there are two different methods to work uh, with, uh, to basically to calculate the, the height of a, of a web view. One is the JavaScript method uh, you mentioned. The problem there is actually right that it might uh, be called multiple times and you get different results and you have to adjust for that. What I found working better um, is basically in, in your delegate did finish loading call, um, uh, set the cell of the web, uh, set the height of the web view to one, and then use size that fits. That allows you to basically uh, retrieve uh, the, the height, basically how, how UI kit thinks the web view is actually. So in this case, not relying on, uh, on JavaScript, but just using the plain UI kit methods. It's, it's a bit ugly that you have to set this, the, the height to, to one, basically, before uh, uh, asking or before doing size that fits. Um, but that at least works for me. Um, I, had, I, have a, um, I think if you search for that on Stack Overflow, I have uh, some code for that, uh, how I do that. Uh, but Essentially, there are, there are these two methods, using JavaScript for that or using that uh, trick with the uh, cell or uh, with a height of one. Um, pick the one that, uh, that you like more, I guess. I, I've tried both, and somehow it seems like the, the size that fit using on the UI web view didn't give accurate results in all times. And it may be dependent on, on, on the nature of, of uh, on the HTML itself, and that's where the big wild card seems to be. Probably depends on how much control you have over the web content. I experienced this um, uh, size that fits methods uh, working quite well uh, for my known HTML that is really always the same, I guess, but it probably doesn't work that well if it's just remote HTML content you, you have no control over. 
On the other hand, in this case, uh, JavaScript also might be flawed in some, t in some ways, depending on, on what, they, uh, what they actually do with JavaScript stuff or so. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, and I think there's not really a, a great solution out of the box, um, and there are just different uh, ugly ways, and you have to, to pick the least ugliest, I guess. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, Uli, thank Uli you very much. Question. Round of applause. We don't have time anymore for more questions for the Uli episode. Was first. <laughs> Sorry. All right, wh what we're going to do is, uh, unless you really have to go to the restroom or whatever, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, stay here. Otherwise, like five minutes, just go and come back uh, because we are running out of schedule and it's my entire, my entire fault. Well, there's a little bit of photo option as well. We have spät angefangen, but you were too long. Uli, you came too quick. I would like to have It now. <laughs> I have to give it a, a one-star rating now. It broke my, my workflow. 